Okay, we're back here live inside theCUBE. This is SiliconANGLE and Wikibon's theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. And this segment uh, is day two, and we're going to break down uh, with uh, our chief analyst, uh, uh, David Floyer, who's on the ground here inside theCUBE to share with us what the hell's happening uh, in the <laughs> sessions because there's so much signal, not a lot of noise, and we, gotta, we can't keep track of it. We need another, we need another cube. Um, we need another analyst. Dave Vellante, if you're out there, you know, come, out, come out here, I know he's watching. Shout out to Dave he's Vellante. Tweeting. Um, I'm, uh, my co-host this week is Jeff Frick. Jeff, David, let's break this down real quick. Um, first of all, horses on the track. <laughs> okay, let's get the horses on the track and then we'll dive into the sessions. So it's David Floyer, first to yeah. get, get hear from you, who are the, what, who are the main horses here um, that are running in this open stack? Obviously Rackspace, they were on the cube. I see yep. a big proponent of it yep. and props to Rackspace. Big yep. halo effect, no need to drill down there. Nope. Um, what other horses do we have on the track? So, so there's, a, there's a combination of, of, of categories. Uh, so the, first of all, there's the vendor category itself. So you've got, uh, key players like IBM, like Dell, like EMC, uh, in conjunction with Cisco and Cisco themselves. You've got, you've got those, as you've got HP with their conversion, the recent moonshot and their converged infrastructure. All of these are offering converged infrastructure in one way or another, uh, either as reference architectures and or uh, actual products themselves. You've got VCE from EMC and Cisco. Uh, you've got uh, Pure from IBM. Uh, et cetera. You've got all of these players in this space, and they are providing economies of scale, uh, they are providing a uh, reference architecture for specific workloads, like for example, an SAP in installation or a VDI installation. So they're offering a, a, economies, a reduction in the complexity and the speed to deliver. Uh, that's one thrust that's going through there. The, uh, the other thrust is people like uh, Google, people like uh, uh, Amazon, uh, people like Yahoo, people like Microsoft, Azure, who, who, are prov who have a huge amount of compute power and are providing access to that compute power and those services and are delivering other services, a lot of them consumer to begin with, but increasingly enterprise services, uh, are uh, Google, for example, providing uh, all of the uh, services like um, uh, Google Docs and all, all of the, those services, the same way as, uh, as Microsoft is. So there's another set of services coming from those sets of people. And then the third are the open, like a Rackspace, are the Open Compute uh, Foundation, the Rackspace Foundation, Eucalyptus, uh, and a few others as well, who are providing a cloud architecture, a cloud uh, platform on which to develop these sorts of applications. And of course, VMware is very much in that space as well with, uh, with theirs. So we've got, I think those are three categories which is useful to break down because there's a lot of similarities. And in what those was the three second categories. category again? So the first was vendors. users, the, the second was the traditional cloud vendors like Microsoft, Google, and the others. So users, and then the cloud third. vendors, and then the yeah. power on task, right. the guys yeah. with computing power. But you said yeah. something very interesting, David, the last uh, segment, is you talked about separating the hardware from the software. Where yes. Before you had an integrated unit yep. that, that, that solved the problem, and now you're separating it. But the flip side of that coin has always been if you try to run best of breed, then you always have an extra layer of integration. And, you <laughs> yes. and, and there's a whole yeah. different kind mm -hmm. of management thing. So, so what's happening now that's different that's kind of swinging the pendulum back towards separation and best of breed? Well, the, the, the key is that what you want to be able to do, uh, the, the, the model originally was, I'm the developer, 
I decide what it's going to be developed on. I will design the hardware and my development software to run as a, as a unit. And that was a vertical stack, if you like. That was the application, either the ISV or the, um, or the, de or the developer, in-house developer. That was the way that they did things. Um, and what's happening now is the uh, DevOps is much more about how can I separate out the software, make the software run itself, the application itself, and then point it at a hardware stack, which is a, a set of resources, a compute resources, network resources, storage resources, and separate out those two. So you've got a hardware stack with those resources, you've got the application which is managing itself, and assuming that it's going to have to go and find those resources. Those resources. Okay. Uh, so it's a, it's a different model. Now that model is what cloud providers are using, that's what uh, all modern platforms are starting to move towards very, very quickly indeed. And the advantage of that model is that it is self-tuning, it's self-providing, and the other advantage of, of it is that it's much easier to put into the cloud and much faster in its turnover. Uh, you don't have to worry about the hardware side of it. You can do something every three months, every six months, right. as opposed to the old way of doing things with ISVs, by the time they got through the whole of the stack, it's a two year cycle. Mm. So the rate of change and the rate of adaption is much, much faster in that environment. Dave, David, I want to ask you a question. You, you and I were talking prior to um, the morning uh, when we kicked off that uh, you know, we were both amazed, but you made a comment I want to share with the crowd. This is a vendor hype free zone <laughs> and there's a lot of real yeah. users stepping yeah. up, demonstrating, yeah. sharing proud and loud what they're doing with OpenStack. Can you yeah. elaborate on the comment sure. and then talk about some of the use cases? And yeah. this is not like you know, a you know, small, never heard of this dot com company, but like it's big amazing. names. So talk big about names. that. Yeah, I mean, th what we had the privilege of with the analyst day was uh, a, 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 one of the best analyst days I've ever been to, if not the best. Uh, and it was a very simple introduction. Here's OpenStack, here's the principles, and then here are the people using it. And so they were able to go straight into the meat and potatoes rather than have this highly orchestrated uh, uh, vendor type of uh, uh, communication. So it was, was, was an excellent day. So to give a few examples, um, for example, uh, Best Buy. They are readers, they are one of the largest uh, retailers uh, uh, in the world. Um, they, they have a huge peak uh, in a Thanksgiving day of every year, seven times the average. I mean, that's a huge peak to have in the middle of the year. So they needed something elastic, something that they could expand into. They needed to be able to build architectures which A, on one side were much more intuitive for the end users, gave a lot more uh, help to the end users, and secondly, could expand to to meet these huge volumes that they were getting. So that was one example, and they've been, uh, they put their new work onto uh, OpenStack, a new uh, rollout of some of their services. One of the key metrics there is that traditionally it takes them 30 seconds or so to get out a page because it has so many additional services that it's added onto. They've taken all of that brought it in-house, brought it inside the cloud, they can now render that page in two and a half seconds. So from an end user perspective, it's now like a Google page. It comes up straight away, within seconds, yeah. as opposed to being something that is comes up so 30 seconds let's later. Let's break that down. So in our world, we talk to all these big whales, you know, IBM, Cisco, HP, Dell, EMC, NetApp, all the top companies and they have an old architecture of all, they come from the, new, the old generation, mm, yeah, and are, yeah. are, are actually part of inventing the new, so those guys are doing a good job. But that world that you just described with Best Buy was hard to do yes. five years ago. Yes, Databases absolutely. were different, yep. um, <laughs> converged <laughs> infrastructure is now software-led infrastructure. Can you explain some of the under the hood things that are relevant and the hot areas that, that are the most explosive from an innovation standpoint? Well, it, the innovation is happening in the cloud, these new ways of designing applications. One of the most important innovations now is much lower latency on I.O. So instead of having the old-fashioned I.O. which took uh, milliseconds to do, you can now, or tens of milliseconds to do, you can now get down to I.O.s of uh, one millisecond, much lower than that. Actually down to now to the microseconds and even into the nanosecond space. 
Now, that has a huge implication on the quality of the application that you can you can make. If you've got all of this compute power and you've got all of this data, now suddenly you can make applications which are much richer in the quality and do more. Uh, and you can make your database structures much simpler, much flatter, mm -hmm. and, and instead of having to run lots of different modules and having to the workflow dictated by the flow of the modules, you can take a flatter database and you can define your workload onto that database. So I want to ask you, because um, there's a company that, that's in Silicon Valley, NetApp, who's in, that you follow, um, they have a, a, a cool expression called Agile Infrastructure. Yeah. Agile, I think mm -hmm. there's, I forget what it's called, Agile Data, whatever, Agile Infrastructure. But that yeah. is a core thesis of theirs, Agility, agi mm -hmm. Agile Enterprises. At the same time, they also have a phrase called Non-Disruptive Operations, mm -hmm. which kind of doesn't mean anything, it's just like a more of a management consulting phrase, but it does, it's categorically mean something. Could you talk about non-disruptive operations from the sense of what you just talked about? I mean, Best Buy has to have variability Mm. agile capabilities to serve and yeah. power their business model. At the same time, there's still the emphasis of non-disruptive operations means we got to have, have availability. So, could you break down what non-disruptive operations means from an industry standpoint? Well, and so you've got planned outages and you've got unplanned outages. Well, first of all, you have to build the application assuming that there are unplanned outages. That Hope for the uh, best, plan for the worst. Uh, right? yeah, well, no, <laughs> your, a server is going to go down. Your, your, yeah. your, your storage is going to go down. You have to build that into the structure of saying, this service is not 100%, this is what you I mean do. As a design criteria. As a design criteria of the application and the infrastructure within it. So that's the number, the first thing you have to do is assume that it's going to it's going to go down, uh, and and uh, have sets of extra compute and and data resources and network resources available to you. The other the other point of the uh, the uh, uh, the um, architecture is that you've got to design in the ability to have planned outage. In other words, that you have rolling changes. So. Beforehand, it was a change every two years. Now, it's a change every three months. And that's, again, a major change in the design that you have to apply to it, which means that you have to be able to swap out the hardware, so swap out doesn't mean there. high availability, it means basically plan and have an, have an, uh, an architecture. Assume that you're going to have to change yeah. on the fly. Whether yeah. it's software upgrades or Absolutely. other things. Everything has to be applied. And talk about in that what way. you think. What is the definition of, in your mind, agile infrastructure? What is the what is what it needs to happen for an infrastructure to be agile? Support developers. It has kind of a developer angle to it. I mean, what does that mean? So the developers and the and the uh, uh, analysts themselves have to be have to be working together to supply an ever changing, quick. Uh, uh, rapid ab ability to put in new levels of software, new levels of hardware, and, and ensure a, a, a seamless transition from one cloud to another cloud, or one version to another version. As David Vellante always says, you're our Peter Gammons of the uh, tech <laughs> business. You come in and give the analysis on <laughs> the inside baseball. But I have the final question before we break is, I want to ask you is, um, in your expert opinion, and, and surveying the field here, and looking at the horses on the track, so to speak, and knowing what's happening in OpenStack, AWS, and the stuff we're covering in software infrastructure, how much impact will DevOps and infrastructure as code have on existing uh, legacy in our all environments right now in the industry, in the data center in particular, uh, and uh, service providers. So, so uh, the impact on current applications with the legacy code within that, it'll have very little impact at all. Uh, it, it's going to be for new code that's coming out and new applications. So the interesting thing is what do you do about those legacy applications and how do you bridge that gap between today's environment, mainly legacy, to tomorrow's environment, mainly cloud-based services. So one of the ways, uh, there are many ways that that can happen. The hybrid cloud is one of those uh, architectures that, that may contribute. But per personally, I believe the better way of doing it is to move the, the traditional IT resources into a co-location facility, into a mega data center, outsource them, and have the cloud services that you're going to use and move over to in that same data center so that you minimize the data flow between them and then uh, maximize the speed at which you can migrate applications to that And I'm going to put you on the spot for a final word here. Of all the big whales we've been talking about, who's best positioned? <laughs> uh, 
for this <laughs> well, for this uh, for this new world. Well, clearly Amazon is having uh, has got a lot of meat behind it. Clearly VMware have a lot of marketplace to lose in this space. But people like Rackspace have uh, a year ago they would have been still way at the back of the pack. They have accelerated and come forward at a huge rate. Uh, and how so about the uh, Cisco's, EMC's, and NetApps of the world? Where are they standing? Uh, IBM. Well, they they are going to they are going to win anyway for a long time with the traditional IT. The, the, these things don't happen in one year or two years. These are these are five, ten year horizons. Still, so they do very well. They have to learn how to work in an open environment, how to contribute to it, and they are very fast and indeed. And, and they're here. They're putting a stake they're in the ground. Exactly. So they're here. EMC is here. And, uh, IBM is here. NetApp is here. Uh, they're contributing to this. Um, okay, David Floyer, again, disruptive technology, disruptive transformative environment, new brands are emerging, new names, startups, but also the big guys are here. They're not going to lose their market share <laughs> easily. <laughs> they're going to reinvent the new and, and uh, exactly. be part of it. So yeah. we'll be right back with one of those from the minute with, uh, we're going to hear from HP inside the theCUBE uh, after the short break. We'll be right back. This is SiliconANGLE's exclusive coverage of OpenStack Summit in Portland, Oregon. <laughs>